Hello all my JavaScript friends, this is the Virtuoid aka Mike Smith and this is video number two in our series for the Devonport card game. If you like this video, please click on the like button below, subscribe to this channel or leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is tackle the test driven development for the Devonport game and we're going to first concentrate on a round. And what exactly is a round? Well, you know if you play a game, any kind of card game, the card game basically is a series of rounds. For example, in poker, uh, a round would be, you know, each player goes through and, and changes in their cards and then eventually displays their cards, takes bets and all that kind of fun stuff. In a game of rummy, uh, it's pretty much the exact same way. You pick up a card, discard a card, that is a round. And so within the Davenport game, a round is where each per as we'll explain here in a second, each person is going to put down their card, reveal it, and then pick up cards or not pick up cards depending upon whether they won or not. So that's going to be a round, and that's the that's the real heart of this game. And so what we're going to do is we're going to first do that. But we first have to get our test system up and running. So what we're going to do is we're going to first install our testing system and it's going we're going to be using Cypress and Cypress is good for testing both at the node level although not quite as good as I originally thought and that's why this video was a little later than normal and and also very good at testing in, in development on the browser so let's get that installed first so to install that all I have to do is type in npm install save dev Cypress and I'll see you on the other side Okay, so we've got that. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to install a Cypress Webpack preprocessor. And what that will allow us to do is kind of compile all of our code so that it can be tested within a node environment. Now, when we get to the browser section, it's hard for me to do two things at one time. When we get to the browser section, uh, our browser, which will be using Vite as a browser, uh, will do that for us automatically. And we really don't need, have a need for this, but Within our node environment, like we have been with all of our other projects, we're going to do the Webpack preprocessor automatically. And that's uh, now been installed, so that's pretty, that's good enough there. That should get our Webpack, um, our, our Cypress all done. So now what we're going to do is we're going to open up the uh, web, uh, the Cypress modules.bin. And what this will do is this will automatically initiate, initialize all the files we're going to need for our Cypress. So I'll see you once it's done. And it's done. When you get this nice pretty little window screen here, it will basically show you that, hey, it's all done and ready to go. We'll close that out. And uh, let's take a look at the files that have gotten changed. So we've gotten a whole bunch of stuff here. There goes all my node modules. Uh, we get the cypress.json, our new package.json, the package lock.json. Uh, no biggies there. Uh, let's take a look at the package.json see what's changed. Not much has changed. We just got the dev dependencies here. And by the way, I forgot to tell you, I already did an npm init on this particular uh, 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 directory here. So that's the reason there's stuff that's already inside here. Our cypress.json is our configuration file, which is absolutely nothing in it. But let's make a couple changes to the Cypress files themselves. And the reason we're going to do that is that we're going, this is going to allow us to be able to make our test development system working correctly. What I've discovered, and one of the reasons it took me so long here, is that once I started getting into uh, working with, start to get the integration with the browser, is that my entire testing network philosophy basically was incorrect. So I had to spend a little bit of time to try to make some changes to it, and finally got it all working. It took me a long time. So the first thing we're going to do here is the integration files are all of the, there's some different uh, examples that you can take a look at to say, uh, hey, this is how an integration file works inside Cypress. Now, we don't care about any of this, so we're just going to delete it. Both of those in there. Okay. Fixtures are, are going to be a, uh, this is where we have our data repository. So we'll put all of our, our uh, JavaScript files inside here that will allow us to be able to grab fake data, mock data, basically. Plugins are different plugins uh, that we can pop into our uh, our system here. So we do want to change that. Is that right now? I just got module module exports has absolutely nothing there. So what we want to do is we want to be we want to now pop a new code inside of there. And there's our new code. And this code basically uses this Webpack preprocessor to do other kind of funky things it has to do. But now here's something very important that you'll want to do is that I've got an index.js file here 
Now to be able to get everybody working very happy together all by itself, uh, we're going to need to be able to put a type module inside of our package.json, which we'll do here in just a second. But once we do this, uh, all the node stuff, stuff starts blowing up. So what I've discovered here to be able to get everything working correctly, nice and pretty and everything, is that we're going to need to be able to tell node that this is actually a common JavaScript file. And it's common, uh, I'm sorry, common AMD file, I believe is what it's called. And this basically um, uses module.exports instead of the normal export or import. So to be able to do that, we're going to change the name of index.js to index.cjs. Extremely, extremely important there. Also, finally, we're on the support. We're not going to be using these, but we also need to change the name of these to index.cjs. And the command, we also need to change to index. or command.cjs. And then finally, in our package.json, we're going to put in type module. And that just basically says that anytime we're going to work with Node, we're going to work with it as if it's a JavaScript module and not a common, uh, I think it's called common JavaScript, common AMD. I don't, I don't ever work with it. So, you know, I always put type.module in everything that I do here. So this is basically things that I've discovered uh, that we need to, once we get everything working, we need to get it working as, you know, best we can for both Node and within the browser. Finally, last thing we want to do is let's go, we're still, while we're in the package.json file, let's put our test commands in there. So the test commands are going inside the script. Notice it says echo no test specified. And that's the reason for that is we've got a, um, we've got basically the, uh, uh, that was the one MP and init puts inside there. But for the scripts here, we're going to have a test e2, e2eci, and this is going to run the cypress.run. This will run it as if we would want to run it within a CI environment. We would do a Jenkins build or something like that. We can run it within there. Or if we just want to run the regular open command, uh, we will run test e2e. And that will fix everything that we should be able to fix everything now for the Cypress testing environment. Okay, so let's go ahead and start creating our test. Now, before we do that, we actually need to create a design for what our round looks like. And I've got a constructor spec here that I've created inside of a round directory, and all my uh, specs for the round will appear within this directory. So what do we consider to be a round within the Davenport game? Well, let's take a look at that. So basically, imagine yourself as actually physically playing the game with, with one or three other people, because there's two to four players. So what happens? Each person each player will lock a card, which means each player will take a card out of their hand and place it face down in front of them. The cards are then revealed, which means all the players will then reveal their cards, turn them face up. Then the winners are determined. There's basically two types of winners. First of all, each, each, a single winner is, can, be, can be declared from a round, which means that one particular player had the highest numbered card in a round. And in Davenport, each card has a certain value to it. The number of cards have their own value, uh, as the number of cards. The ace has the value of one, the jack has the value of 11, queen 12, and jack, uh, excuse me, king 13. If there are two or more winners, which means if there's a tie, then there is no round winner. So on the winners, if there is a round winner, they do not pick up a card, but if the, all the other people will pick up a card. So if you have a tie, everybody will pick up a card. If there's one single winner, then the other people pick up a card. The game will end when a player has no cards left. So after all the cards are picked up, you take a look at each of the hands and find out, oh, hey, this player has zero cards left. This game is over. And we just repeat and over and over and over again until there is a winner. So what would that look like in JavaScript? Now, this may not be exactly what we're going to end up with, but this is kind of what's going to happen here. We're going to play rounds. We're going to lock the cards. Then we're going to get the winners. Then we're going to replace the cards. Then we're going to check for the game over, and then player not we're going to catch a player not responding. So what exactly is happening here? We got an async. We got thens and thises and promises and all that kind of fun stuff. What's happening here? Well, the problem here is that when we do a lock card, that is actually an asynchronous operation. If you have four players in the game and they're all computer players, then we know there's going to be four cards played no matter what. But if you have at least one human player something might happen. So let's project out into the future. You're playing this game, you against three computer opponents, and suddenly your dog throws up all over the carpet. Ugh. Well, you got to get up and go clean it up and everything. Problem is the game is sitting there waiting on you to play a locked card, and it's only going to give you, let's say, a minute to play a locked card. And if you haven't played a locked card, then it's going to basically time out. It's going to assume, well, you've lost interest in the game, or if you happen to be a network game, you've lost connection. And so it's going to 
return a rejection that the player is not responding. Otherwise, it's going to return saying, hey, I've got all the lock cards, then we can do the winners, replace the cards, and check for game over. So this is the general flow of what the round is going to look like. We, we just got to make sure that we're going to at least do a, a synchronous operation when we play the game. So this is what a sample round will look like. And I just noticed I've got a misspelling right there. Sample round, sample round of play will look like. Okay, so now let's create the constructor. Very, very simple here. This is what our constructor is going to look like. This is what I imagined it to be, is that when we click the new round, we need to get the round number. We need to get the players and we need to get the deck. Now, uh, I love to have private variables, so I'm going to store everything inside private variables, which means I'm going to need to have access to have round number players and deck, and we'll get to that a little bit later on. But uh, basically, that's what our constructor is going to look, look like. All three of these are going to require pieces of information. So if they are not there, then we're going to throw some exceptions. So let's go ahead and test for that. So here are our tests. And basically, it's very simple. We should be able to create a round instance, which you know, we do on all of our stuff. It's no, no biggie, no big deal there. Exceptions. We should be able to throw an exception if a round number is missing. And all of these are going to perform this basically the same pattern. To catch exceptions within Cypress, we do a try. We do what we're pretending to do. And if it makes it through, that means we didn't throw the exception. So we force an assertion error by saying expect true to be false. Otherwise, we catch the error and make sure it's, it is a type error. If it's not a type error, which is what uh, JavaScript will, you know, which will throw or JavaScript will throw depending upon the situation, uh, then that's it, you know, no, 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 nothing there. So, so we're going to check to see if the round number is missing. We're going to check players is missing, check the deck is missing. Again, all of these follow the exact same uh, pattern. Uh, if we're going to check for the round number, we want to make sure the round number is numeric and we're going to make sure the round number is greater than zero. So we're going to throw exceptions if it is not numeric, which very simply is just pass it a non-numeric value and make sure that it is greater than zero. So yeah, we just pass a negative one. That should do it there too. Uh, make sure that the players is an array because we're going to be passing an array of players. These are all the players that are involved within the game. So we're first of all going to make sure that it is definitely an array. We're going to make sure that it is uh, an array of player, which means I just can't pass any array. I got to pass an array of the player object. And finally, Make sure that the deck itself is an instance of the deck, which this type area will be able to check for. And that should take care of everything within our constructor. Now, before we continue on here, let's take a look at our uh, imports here. Notice we're importing virtual.de. So let's bring up Node and let's install it. It's going to be in save, virtual deck. And that will install the virtual deck for us. So now if we flip back over to our code, we should be missing, yep, the squiggly nine has now disappeared. So that's all we need to do for the constructor specifications. Okay, so earlier I said on the constructor, I like to have private variables. Uh, in fact, I also like to have them as read-only as possible. So we're gonna probably need to have three more tests to be able to make sure that round number can be accessed, players can be accessed, and deck can be accessed. Now, uh, with the players though, uh, as I was thinking about this, it's really not important on the player side to have access to the players as it is to have access to individual players. Uh, for instance, having some sort of get player method to be able to grab a player or to know how many players are actually in the game itself. So I'm not going to have anything to access players. I'm just going to be able to access num player, number of players and a get player type method. So let's create our four specs to do that and run through them very quickly. We're going to create a spec for round number. Of course, it would help if I actually spelled it right. Number.spec. We're going to need one for deck. Deck.spec. We're going to need one for num players. Spec. And we're going to need one for what do I, oh yeah, get player, which is a which is going to be a uh, public method. Alrighty, so let's run through some of those real quick. Now get a uh, the uh, round number is going to be a read-only value. So let's click some, let's get some code inside there. It's going to be a read-only value. So really only just a couple of things to be able to check for. And it's basically, should we be able to read the round number and we should not be able to change it? And it's very simple. Uh, if I pass it the round of one, it should come back as a round of one. And if I try to change it, it should blow up on me. 
and there's really not the much left it there for doing the round number. The deck works the exact same way. Let's bring up the code for the deck. And basically, again, I should be able to read the deck and that's what I'm trying to do here. I should be, it should be an instance of deck and I should not be able to change it. So if I try to change it, it should blow up on me. Okay, for non-players, again, I'm gonna make players to be private. Uh, and I don't really want them to have access to players themselves uh, because if, if you have access to players being an array, you can sit there and change that array even though it's a private variable. So I don't want them to have access to the players themselves. So I will have give them access to how many players are actually there, which is the length of the array. So let's go into num players and let's throw that code inside there. And this is very simple. I got a little, this time I did a little bit, a little be before each, each and every single time. Cause why? Cause I wanted to. Uh, I should be able to return the number of players. So when round is created, which is, which is created right here, I should find a two right there. Uh, and it should throw an exception if we try to change it. So if I try to change the players to five, that should throw an actual exception. Yeah, and that's all we really need to check for. And finally, they need to have some way to be able to grab a player. So what's the player going to, what's this get player going to look like? This is going to be a public method. So I need to have them some way to identify the player. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass an object with the ID variable inside that object for them to search on ID. So let me pull up the code for that real quick. And as you can tell here, we just got the, kind of the same before each as we had with the non-players, and it should be able to retrieve a player based upon ID. Now, why did I put it inside an object there instead of a, as an argument? And the reason I did that was in the future, I might want to be able to say, I want to get this player using this particular parameter, or get this player using that particular parameter, or pass some sort of SQL statement or something. And I'm, I'm really going way out there for that. By having it as an object there, I am, I am freeing myself from being confined to saying, okay, no matter what, 10 years down the road, I still have to pass that ID as the first argument, even though I've had other arguments later. This is going to free me to do pretty much whatever I want to do. So, and this is very simple. It should retreat the player based upon the ID, which I retrieve the player. It should be equal, player should be equal to player zero because I'm trying to retrieve A, and it should return null if the player is not found. So that's real simple. If player is not found, it should return null. If it's found, it should return the player itself. And that should take care of the round number, the num players, uh, the get player, and, and the deck spec. So if we go to constructor, that should, that, yep, yeah, that will take care of now of all the three different required pieces of data that we have for the round. Okay, now let's get to the other public variable for the round method, and that is the play. Because now we think about, um, let's go back to our constructor here. This is basically the play round that we came up with on the constructor. And so this is basically what we want to be able to do on the round itself. So I envision a, the round having a play method that the game will say, hey, round, go play and return something. And the round will return back something. And then the game will determine whether it needs to continue on playing the game or something has happened to stop the game. So we're going to call that play. And I've already included all the information. Before we start, I want to be able to install something called standarddeck.js because it's saying that you know it can't, it's not there. So that happens to go inside of our fixtures. So let me copy that inside of our fixtures here. And this basically is a large uh, file that I have all of my different data uh, for the test already ready to go. All the different decks and everything, copies of decks, all the standard mapping and for the values and all that kind of fun stuff. The big thing here is the initialized test, which goes through everything that I want to do to get all of the players set up correctly, the deck set up correctly, uh, the round, you know, the round number set up correctly, and then I pass all that information back to the calling program. And that will allow me to be able to have a clean deck or, or a clean round every time I run a test. Um, just checking real quick, yep, nothing else to install. I can't install player around because there is no player around yet. So if we go to we go to a play spec before each, there's our initialized test. And this is where I'm getting the deck players and round number and round. And uh, do, 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 and then we're doing get players to get player A and B. No big deal, no, no big deal there. So let's take a look at our four tests. So again, what are the four different results we have from the play? For result number one is that we can play a complete round with no overall game winner. No problem there. The second possible test, that was this one, by the way, 
The second one is we should be able to play a complete round with an overall game winner, which basically means that once we play the round, the game is over. Then we should be able to play a complete round with a tie for the winners. That means basically that we had two people play the card that had the exact same values. So there is no winner. And then we should be able to error out because a player did not lock a card, which basically means, hey, you know, your dog threw up on carpet, so you've kind of dropped out of the game here. So let's take a quick look at these very quickly. Uh, all right, so we do side dot wrap round. This is Cypress's way of turning this particular round object into something it can work with. And this is the best way to be able to do promises within the Cypress system, at least the best way that I know of as of right now. If you know of a better way, well, let me know in the comments. So then we do the play command right there. There's our play. We're binding it to round to make sure that our this is correct. And then that will always return a round information actually it just it just it just re uh it it returns itself basically so we can kind of chain everything together if necessary so what are we expecting on a playing a complete round with no overall game winner well we should expect game over to be false of course our error should be null because no errors occurred our winners should be an instance of array and that should be a true the length of the winners should equal to one because there was just one winner that winner zero should be equal to player A because within initialized test, which is over here, I've made absolutely certain that player, the way I've dealt the cards out, I've made certain that player A is going to win. So winners zero should be player A. So I should expect the card count for player A to still be, to be at four. Man, we start off with five cards when we deal out when we deal out the cards, which means player A who won is only going to have four, but player B will have five because they have that because they lost the round, so they had to pick up another card. So that should take care of everything for the round with no overall winner. Well, what if it happens with a round with a with with a game winner? Well, I first of all took all the cards out of player A's deck except for one card, a card that I know is going to win. So then I play the round. What will happen? Well, the game over should be true. The winners should be equal to should be zero should be equal to player A. Expect round, expect round dot error to be null, and expect the player A deck card count to equal zero. And there is one more thing I want I should put inside here, and that's expect. And I just thought about this winners dot length to equal one, because we want to be absolutely certain that what we have uh, that we only got one winner there. So. When we have an overall winner, we want to be able to not only know that it's player A in this particular case, but also that there's only one winner. So I just I just realized that in my test that I missed that. So hey, we popped that in there. All right. So what happens if we play when there is a tie? Well, let's take a look at that. All right. To make sure there's a tie, I have given player uh, B a deck here and uh, or an additional card. And that additional card has a value of 10, which will match the highest card that is inside of player's A hand. So we play the round. We get the round. Game over. Should be false. The length of the winners should be 2. Cool. All right. I don't have to test that what two winners they are because I'm only testing two things. Player A deck should be 5. Player B deck should also be 5. In actuality, player B deck should be 6 because, remember, I gave him an extra card up here. So he started out with 6 cards up there instead of 5. So that's one of the things when you're when I'm doing the videos here, I suddenly realize, oh, I made a little mistake there, I made a little mistake right there, you know, here, there, whatever. So, so that should be six. So if there is a tie, that remember there is no winner if there's a tie, so everybody picks up a card. So A threw away a card, which gave him four, the pickup cards gave him five. I gave player B an extra card here. So they started off with six, they threw away a card, which was five, and then they picked up another card, which gets them back to six. And then finally, we have the pick up the dog throw up all over the carpet person and so we reinitialize the test to say human equals true so as of right now I have or as of right now I'm not going to worry about whether a human is playing the game or not uh, so I'm just going to throw an exception if this person is a human now later on I'm going to change these tests and I'm going to change the code to say hey you know we're going to put the information in to be able to human be able to uh to throw a card, especially when we get to the browser game, is when we're actually going to do that. So I'm changing, I'm changing my player A to a human true. I'm getting player A to make sure I've reset player A. I'm playing the round. Then game over should be true because hey, the game game's over now at this point. The winners' length should be zero, which means there were no overall winners, but the game is over. Why? 
because now our error contains an exception, which is the error. And what player threw the error? It was player A that threw the error. So this will give us all the information we need to be able to know exactly what happened whenever a round is played. We have no overall winner. We have an overall winner. We have a tie for winners and a player timed out when trying to lock the card. So that takes care of all of the specs for our particular play method. Okay, we are actually just about done. There's really one more big thing to take a look at. If you notice that when we're working with the inside the play here that we assume there's a couple of variables that are, 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 that are available to us on the round. And there are all three of them listed here. Game over, error, and winners. So now we're going to need to be able to test to make sure that our game over is going to be a read-only va read value and that we cannot change it. We're going to make sure that error is a read-only value that we cannot change it. We'll make sure that winners is a read-only value and that we cannot change it. So how do we do that? Well, we do that just like we did with the dumb players and the round numbers and all that is we create the spec and then we pop the code in there to test for it. So let's go ahead and create the game over spec. And let's pop some code inside there. And here's the code. Very, very simple. We should be able to read the game over property, which by default, when we, we create a, a round, it should the game over should be false, which that's what we'll check for. And we should not be able to change it. So we, once we try to change it, it should you know go boop, and that should be it. And that's pretty much all there is on the game over. So what's next? Uh, looks like the error is next. So let's create the error spec. And let's pop the code in there. And here is the code. Very, very simple. It works just like all the other ones did. We should be able to read the error. By default, the error is null when we first create a new round. Otherwise, we should not be able to change it or else it should blow up on us. Now, what about if there is an exception? Should we test to make sure that the exception has been thrown correctly or not? No, we don't have to. And the reason for that is that's already done within the play specification here. See, there it is right there. So we don't have to test for it twice. We're just going to test for it one time. So that completes the error one. Let's see, since we're here, let's take a look at the next one. We've now got game over, we've now got error. Uh, winners looks like to be the very last one. So let's create a winners spec. And let's pop some code in there. And here we are, just the same as before. By default, it's gonna be an array and that the length should be zero. And if we try to create it and we try to change it, it should blow up on us and throw the exception. So that takes care of the winners on there. So we got the game over, we got the error, we got the winners. Let's just check the other ones just to make sure there's nothing else that we may have forgotten. Da, 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 nothing there. And let's check here. Um, nope, nothing there. And let's check here. And oh, we got get player. Well, we already got get player spec, so we're okay there. So that appears to be it. There's nothing else. I'm just checking my notes here to make sure I haven't forgotten something really stupid. And it looks like I haven't. Well, there's something. There's, there, there's a novel thing for you. I haven't forgotten anything stupid. So that basically takes care of all of our tests for the rounds. we got the constructor. We've taken care of all the read-only properties uh, that we passed to the constructor, which is deck, uh, num uh, deck, players, and round number. We've taken care of the get player method, which is going to be public, and the play method which can be public and within play that gives us the game over property that gives us the error property and that gives us the winners property so let's run the test and during the test it's npm run test e to e ci and i'll see you on the other side and we're back, and as you can tell, we've got nine errors here on the specs, and all of them have the same thing. This occurred while Cypress was compiling or bundling your test code. This is usually caused by a missing file or dependency. Well, no duh, because we haven't created any source code yet. So that basically completes all of the specifications for our round. Hey, if you like this video, click on the like button below. Make sure you subscribe to this channel or leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you. 
and thanks again so much for watching this video. Next video will be video number three, which will actually do the code for the round itself. So again, thank you very much so much for watching. This is the Virtual Way, aka Mike Smith. We'll catch you on the next video.